Good evening. I'm Jerry Eddins, Chairperson of Citizens for Milford, and I am here tonight with our other moderator, Tom Harmon. Tom is also a member of Citizens for Milford as well as a town meeting member. On behalf of all the members of Citizens for Milford, we welcome you all here tonight, voters and candidates. Tonight, we are hosting our 11th candidate forum, an opportunity for Milford voters to hear directly from the candidates and to enable you, the voters, to ask your own questions in a fair and neutral setting. We are so grateful to once again be partnering with Milford TV. Not only are they managing the sound and live broadcast, they are also recording this important community event to ensure as many voters as possible can get the information needed to cast informed votes on Tuesday, April 2nd. We also extend our thanks to the Milford Select Board and Town Administrator, as well as to the custodians for helping us to set up. And I do see that we have Chairman Mazzucchelli and Selectman Walsh with us here this evening. Thank you for joining us. This year's town election includes three contested races. One three-year seat on the Board of Health, three three-year seats on the school committee, and one one-year seat on the trustees of Vernon Grove. The two candidates running for that position opted not to participate in tonight's forum. In the first half, we will hear from two of the candidates running for the open seat on the Board of Health. Candidate Charles Scaff is not participating tonight. The second half of the forum will include all four candidates running for school committee. Tom? Now for the format of the forum. Uh, each candidate will have two minutes uh, to make an opening statement. Once the candidates finish their opening statements, we'll move on to the challenging segment. This segment will vary slightly for the two groups of candidates. We'll explain in greater detail as we reach each segment of the program. Following the challenging segment, we will move on to citizen participation, in which we'll invite everyone in the audience to ask questions. If time permits, we will also pose questions that have been submitted in advance by email and Facebook, and that continue to be submitted online and on phone this evening. We will manage the time fairly using a color-coded lighting system that enables candidates to track their time for the opening statements and answers to the questions. Uh, the screen is up there. Green indicates time has started. Yellow indicates your time is almost up. And red, you're out of time. Uh, I don't have a buzzer, but I will make that sound if you go over, okay? <laughs> Jerry? Okay, so let's begin. The candidates for one seat on the Board of Health who are here with us this evening are Lori Ann Braza and Diana Haynes. Welcome, Lori Ann and Diana, to tonight's forum. Earlier this evening, the order of the candidates' opening statements was determined, and so Diana, could you please give us your opening statement? Good evening, and a sincere thanks to the citizens from Milford for hosting this event and extending an invitation for me to participate. I would also like to express my gratitude to everyone in attendance. My name is Diana Haynes, and I am a lifelong resident of Milford, proud to be a registered nurse. The mission of the Milford Board of Health, and I quote, is to guide the health department in promoting, protecting, and sustaining environmental and public health. During my career, I worked for the Milford Visiting Nurses Association as a staff member and manager dedicating 35 years of service. The VNA had a contract with the town to provide public health nursing service to its residents. The contract encompassed activities such as communicable diseases, investigations, education through various types of health clinics, support to school nurses, as well as home visits. In 2004, a demographic shift in the town led to an upsurge in tuberculosis cases. I played a pivotal role in tracking and monitoring these cases, ensuring proper treatment and compliance to mitigate the spread. 
Understanding the cultural beliefs and norms of those affected was crucial for compliance as I collaborated closely with the Board of Health and state regulatory agencies. The Board of Health's responsibility is to rigorously enforce bylaws, state health codes, general laws, and federal laws, ensuring environmental health and safety for a healthy and safe community. All residents are accountable for abiding by these regulations with no exceptions from the consequences for violations. Observing the evolving demographics of the community has reignited the passion I developed while working for the VNA. I am devoted to serving the residents of the town by strict enforcement of regulations to maintain and enhance environmental health and safety. I am prepared to contribute 110% of my experience, knowledge, and time to stay informed about changes in current regulations as well as new ones in order to advise the health department effectively. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Laurie Ann, your opening statement, please. Thank you. Thank you to the citizens of Milford for sponsoring the candidates forum this evening. My name is Laurie Ann Barraza, and I'm a candidate for the Milford Board of Health. I'm proud to say that I was born and raised in Milford and chose to raise my three boys here. For the last two decades, I have volunteered with many organizations, including Special Olympics, religious education, Milford Football, Salvation Army, Milford High School School Council, and have been a town meeting member for the last 15 years. I've also served on many boards, including the Milford Youth Lacrosse, After Prom, Milford Lions, and all the PTOs, Brookside, was, excuse me, Woodland, and Stacy Middle School. I am currently the Executive Director for the Milford Housing Authority. I began my career in the public service working in the Milford Building Department as the Assistant Zoning Enforcement Officer and in the Milford Board of Health as a Health Inspector. As the Assistant Zoning Enforcement Officer, I served as a member of the Milford Task Force comb combating the issues of, over of overcrowding and resulting negative impacts. The task force at the time was made up of representatives from the Building Department, Board of Health, Board of Assessors, the Fire Department, and the Police Department. Today I participate in this forum as a candidate for the Milford Board of Health, hoping to earn your votes so that I can once again begin to combat the overcrowding and negative impacts that result from it. It affects all aspects of the town, but especially our schools. As a member of the, Mil of the Board of Health, I will have the opportunity to make real changes so that the next generation will also choose to stay in Milford and raise their families here as I did. We have real issues in this town, and I believe the Board of Health has the ability and the authority to address them. I look forward to speaking with all of you tonight about the issues that are important to you and answer any questions you may have for me. I ask you for your vote on April 2nd. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to the next segment of the forum, the Milford Board, the Milford Board of Health Challenge. The format of this segment is as follows. I'll start by asking Diana to present a key issue she believes the Board of Health needs to address. She'll have two minutes to discuss, and then Lorianne will have two minutes to provide her own insights into that issue. And then we'll have Lorianne present her first issue. So Diana, let's begin with you. Um, the issues that I have are not um, in any particular priority. Um, so I'm gonna begin with education. As a lifelong resident of Melvinette, I often see and hear how much the town has changed. In speaking with residents during this process, I have found that many individuals do not understand the role of the Board of Health. Public health touches us in our lives in multiple ways throughout every day, from turning on the water in the morning to brushing our teeth or making coffee, flushing the toilet, putting out the trash, eating in, out in a restaurant, going to the tanning salon or gym, and even shopping in a grocery store. This involves the work of the public health department. Educating all town residents is pivotal for improving compliance to state and local regulations. Many individuals have relocated from diverse countries, each with its unique conditions. Cultural norms not only shape perceptions of adequate living conditions, but also influence practices related to food handling, access to health care, education, and economics. Despite these variations, the Board of Health is mandated to enforce regulations uniformly. Every resident must comply. 
Education is crucial for reducing risk and sustaining a healthy, safe environment. Forms catering to both English and non-English speakers, involvement of church communities, collaboration with school nurses, and coordination with the Department of Public Health for immunization compliance are effective strategies. Understanding cultural norms, beliefs, and values is vital in this education process. Maintaining a list of available community resources in a variety of languages is essential for all residents. Collaborating with local resources only increases ways of providing important information to all residents of Milford. Thank you. Laurie Ann? I would have to agree. Education is very important. But I do believe there are a lot of resource, resources in town, especially in the school system, in regards to educating families um, in various languages in regards to different regulations that the Board of Health has from vaccinations to food handling. Um, I would like to see more of it. I would have to agree. There's not much more I can say about that, but I do believe that's a, a very important issue. Great. Thank you. By the way, there is no uh, punishment for not going the full two minutes. <laughs> that's good. So that's okay. I'm very short to the point. <laughs> All right. Uh, Lori Ann, let's hear your first issue. Thank you. Um, again, not in any order, and I will have to say the two issues I would like to speak to all of you this evening are about um, are issues I know that cannot be uh, solved overnight. The f first issue is the overcrowding. The overcrowding issue has been a very, very, very big issue. As earlier overcrowd, excuse me, I'll start again, I apologize. As, as earlier overcrowding, as I said earlier, it is a major issue in this town. It's impacting our schools and our town resources. Back in 2000, the t town meeting members passed Article 37. Um, and then in 2007, it was implemented. And at that time, the Board of Health hired an outside company to inspect all rental properties. Um, and during that time, the task force was also formed, which I was a part of. Um, the units that the outside agency inspected that they couldn't get in or there were problems, uh, myself, the building department, and the task force actually went in and inspected those apartments um, and followed up with the Board of Health um, and the landlords. During that time, we held landlords accountable um, with all the health, building, and safety violations. I believe that um, if we could do this again, because it's been many years since all the apartments have been reinspected, um, and bring the t task force back. Um, and going out on a weekly basis, as we did uh, for many years as I was with the town, I think it would make a difference. Great, Diana. Um, my second issue also is overcrowding. <laughs> Actually, Diana, um, this, uh, and this one here, oh yeah, you're responding to her, her okay. issue, right? So, yeah. um, yes, um, my second issue is also overcrowding. So I, I guess if I do my presentation, it will be a response to her. Okay. Good with you. Um, ad adequate housing is a fundamental human need. The economic landscape and demographic shifts have led, led to increased overcrowding in the community, affecting both rental properties and privately owned homes. Overcrowding not only fosters the spread of infectious diseases, but also poses the risk of excess waste potentially attracting insects and rodents. Multifamily houses as well as housing developments pose an additional risk to spread as insects and rodents can move from apartment to apartment via the walls. Additionally, this places a blight on the neighborhoods. Um, I also wanted to talk about Article 37, which is a um, Board of Health um, bylaw that the town established and the Board of Health determines the lawful occupancy limits under the Massachusetts Sanitary Code and Board of Health regulations. Ultimately, the landlords bear the responsibility to adhere to the certificate. All landlords must be held accountable for their properties. Often rental properties in town are not adequately maintained when there is an absentee law landlord. Residents in the neighborhoods where there are rental properties and suspected overcrowding need to notice the number of people coming and going from a particular house or apartment, an increase in the number of vehicles routinely parked in the area, 
as well as the amount of trash that is put out to be picked up. These concerns should be reported to the Board of Health rather than be posted on social media. All reported suspicions of violations are investigated by the Board of Health. The town has passed basic regulations okay. by establishing a okay. task force. Okay, Diana, let's, um, if we could, thank you for your uh, response to that. Do you have another issue you'd like to present as well? You do have the floor if you've got a second issue to present. Um, that was my second issue, but I wanted to make what um, my recommendation for the overcrowding um, as, uh, it can be a response to her. Well, you, it, it can be your issue, and then okay. and then uh, and right. then we'll let Lorian respond to that and present her second okay. issue. Okay. So um, I propose the involvement of a community liaison from one of the local churches which would enhance trust in many of these situations. Many residents are affiliated with a church which has become their local network within the town. Adding a liaison from the co church community will provide an atmosphere of support and security. This person would allow the resident to feel a sense of trust from their own network and educate landlords and residents to regulations and the consequences of noncompliance. Thank you. Lorian, do you have a response to that or your own recommendation on how to address that issue? Um, as I said earlier, the recommendation would, of course, um, I think we need to reinspect all rental properties as we did back in 2007 um, and bring back the task force on a regular basis where uh, we used to go out as a task force and on a, a, a weekly basis and we looked for abundance of trash and too many cars and we used to get every day between the Board of Health and the building department, we would get call after call because they knew that we were out there, um, the task force on a weekly basis. So we would hit a neighborhood um, and, you know, and focus on that neighborhood. And we were able to combat um, a lot of overcrowding at that time. Great, thank you. Now you have an opportunity to present your second issue. Sure, um, kind of goes hand in hand with Diana said. <laughs> um, clearly these are very uh, important issues to both of us. Um, so my other issue, I believe, is trash. Uh, he, trash goes hand in hand with the overcrowding. Uh, uh, the Board of Health every day gets, gets a number of, a large number of calls on a daily basis in, in relation to trash. Trash being scattered all over neighborhoods and abundance amount of trash out on the curb, especially in neighborhoods with rental properties. Just take a ride down Grove Street or Oliver Street or even South Main Street and you see this every single day. Um, my recommendation for that is to uh, contract with the waste management company that we currently use or we go into a contract with a new company um, and purchase trash barrels and require residents to put trash in those barrels and the hope is obviously to no cost to the residents if possible. Uh, this would contain the trash and help clean up the neighborhoods um, and, either, and cut down the calls for the Board of Health and then also it would help cut down the cost of trash removal for the town. Great, thank you. Diana, do you have any insights to the trash issue in the town? Um, the only thing that I see is when I looked into the Board of Health um, and the number of responsibilities that the staff have for inspections and um, I have a, a whole list, and if you go on the website for the Board of Health, they do um, I, and are responsible for a lot of things with a small number of people that work within the department. Um, I think her suggestions are very good, but I think perhaps trash um, as the, uh, I, I believe the um, transfer station was perhaps transfer to a different department um, that maybe the town could look at a better way to handle the trash by, you know, a different department that's more um, involved with um, the other things that go on such as the recycling station and the, I mean the transfer station and with the um, uh, leaf dump up at the other end of town. Um, I think it's a huge responsibility to place in the 
hands of the Board of Health to take calls on a daily basis because the trash man didn't show up to pick up my recycles or the trash man didn't come to get my um, trash today. Um, and as far as with the overcrowding, I think that that has increased multifold in the, um, since the beginning. Um, and that has increased the amount of trash in town. Thank you. Great. Okay. So now it is time for Milford voters to ask their own questions of these two candidates. We invite anyone who has a question to please walk up to the standing microphone up here at the front at any time. Members of the audience, we ask that you please limit your questions to 30 seconds. Candidates, please try to respond with an answer that is no longer than two minutes. Questions can be directed to one particular candidate or to both candidates. If a question is directed to only one candidate, she will have two minutes to respond and the other candidate will have one minute to comment. The candidate who answered initially will have one minute to rebut if desired. The moderators reserve the right to extend the answer time if needed. Importantly, members of the audience, we do ask that you please be considerate when you are stating your question. Each candidate has supporters in the room. We ask that you be respectful, avoid personal attacks, and we do reserve the right to dismiss an insensitive or inappropriate question to cut off political statements and to move on. Thank you. And lastly, a reminder to folks who are watching at home. Please submit any questions that you have right now by Facebook, email, text, or phone call. The information about that is provided directly on your screen. We will try to pose as many of your questions as possible. So let's get started. Um, we have one person at the microphone right now, but as we, um, we have a bit of time for, for questions, so um, please feel free to walk up to the mic at any time. Mr. Visconti. Uh, thank you, uh, and, and thank you, citizens from Milford, for, for, for orchestrating and holding this event. I think it's very important, and it, and it helps the Milford voters get a true understanding of who the candidates are and, 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 and what they believe they can do for our town. And also, thank you to the candidates for putting their name out there and putting themselves out there uh, for the same for the same reason my question is uh, to both candidates uh, periodically or and and I believe in the past the Board of Health has conducted inspections of restaurants uh, to make sure that they are in compliance and they're uh, and they're, uh, they're 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 keeping the restaurants clean and I was going to say the rats are well fed, but I won't say that. Uh, in any case, uh, my understanding is that these inspections in the past have been pre-noticed. By that I mean the restaurants are made aware that there is going to be an inspection. Do you think that there should be a pre-notice to these inspections or should they be surprise inspections so that you can truly get a sense of how the restaurant is being operated? Thank you. Lori Ann, why don't you answer first, please? As you know, um, or you do, you don't know, uh, every, every restaurant in town requires a food license. Um, and yes, I think um, they should be told um, that when the inspections happen, um, of course, if the Board of Health finds any sort of violations, I would say that they go back and then they, they do not notify them when they come back to make sure that they take care of those uh, violations. But I think it's, it's fair to say that they should be told. That's my opinion. Diana? My understanding is that the food inspections are done not only for restaurants, but any um, convenience store or any type of um, uh, place that sells or handles food. And uh, I disagree. I um, worked um, 
for the VNA for many years, and we would have um, uh, inspections done by the Department of Public Health or by the Joint Commission. And they were not, we were not pre-warned. Um, I believe that if the restaurant owners or the convenience store owners know the regulations, then they should always be in compliance with the regulations, and there should be no reason to give them notice that the inspection is being done. Um, if they have violations, I believe the food inspector can provide them with um, some uh, education as to where they need improvement and I think it would be okay to give them a notice that I'm going to be back in two weeks or you have so many days to improve this but food um, handling is a huge source of um, communicable diseases and if it's not stored and handled properly especially with the new laws around allergies and posting allergies in the restaurants um, and if people are not in compliance with that it, it it's, can create a huge um, problem for the people who eat there thank you next question please Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. My name is Ann Walton. I'm a registered nurse. I just retired from 40 years of nursing. Thank you both for wanting to take on this responsibility because I know it's a, it's a huge one. Um, and I just have a quick statement about the trash. Um, I wonder if perhaps the town could emphasize with not only the trash pickup but the recycling pickup that no matter where you live in town, if it's a windy day, or if it's they're rushed because it's a holiday and they take the blue bin and they throw it in the recycling bin and the little plastic things that your berries they go flying away like the bird they don't pick them up and they just fly from house to house and they fly through the neighborhood until one of the walkers picks them up so that's that's just my first comment it's not just in rental property and i don't think it's just the people who live in apartments that sure. you know that have an issue with not taking care of their trash i think it's a, a combined responsibility um, um, and do, would you just pause just a minute? Yes. Do either of you have a response to her statement? I would just have to agree. Yeah. So. Okay. Diana? So. Um, I think it's a matter of speaking with the company, but I'm not sure what their, their rules and regulations right. are with the company that they contract with. Um, I, I think, yes, you're right, it's a problem. But, right. I, I'm, okay. I guess I'm just saying that it's our responsibility as residents and renters to make sure our trash is properly disposed of and put out on the side of the, the street. But I think it's equally responsible for the people who, I, I mean, I don't know how they work, but it seems to me, my husband always says, the faster they go, it doesn't matter the quality of their work. They, they, when they finish, they're done. So if they can be finished by one, their day is finished. And I don't know whether that's true. That's totally speculation. Uh -huh. But all I'm saying is that I think it's a partnership between the residents and the trash collection. Okay. Um, yeah. And now my real question is, um, with the national increase in vaccine denial and avoidance and the recent epidem endemic, excuse me, endemic of measles in Florida, how will you ensure that science, data, and facts govern public health policies and are, are, are ensuring that state policies, national public policies, are actually enacted with few exceptions. Um, primarily because as somebody who's taking care of people with polio, with uh, you know, all, all kinds of communicable diseases as a nurse, it terrifies me to think that the, you know, those laws may be lax. So are you a promoter of facts and science to be the foundation of public health policy? Thank you for the question, thank you. Diana, I'm gonna let you, um, can you please respond first? Yes, 100%. I feel that science um, rules um, the uh, uh, rules and regulations that the Department of Health puts into um, practice. Uh, there is the Department of Health 
tracks the number of cases for flu, for um, measles, for COVID. They have a database that the Board of Health has access to that we should be within the department looking at on a frequent basis, if not on a daily basis. And we can tell um, by looking at that database from the Department of Public Health if there's an uptick in cases in our area. And then going forward, we can um, speak with the school nurses to see if they're tracking those. I believe that with the immigrant, uh, the migrants that are coming into the country, the Department of Public Health has taken over the vaccination process and the schools um, are wor at work with the Department of Public Health um, to ensure that the um, regulations are met or to see if there's any exceptions. No. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We want to be sure that we get as many different. <laughs> um, Lorian, could you reply, please? Um, I would have to agree with Diana. I, I agree with science and regulations. But I do believe uh, that the Board of Health currently and has in the past, um, you know, does check the database and they do educate the schools. They do reach out to the community as much as they can. I've been involved in some COVID clinics. I've been involved in some educational seminars. I've been at the school. I've been in community um, organizations where that education is brought out. So I think it's very important and I think it, it, it is happening um, here and the Board of Health is trying to keep up with it. Okay. Since there's nobody um, at the microphone at the moment. No, oh, one more. okay, here we go. <clears throat> Thank you very much for being here tonight. It's been very informative. Um, I'd like to direct my question to each of you. Um, and my question is about mosquito-borne diseases. And, um, you know, looking over the past two years, the weather patterns have been quite different. Um, we went from a drought in the summer of 2022 to significant rainfall in 2023 that continued through the fall and, and through the winter. And I've been a Milford resident in my current house for about 30 years now. And, you know, I'm not a climatologist or a meteorologist, but I know standing water. And there's a significant amount of standing water throughout. I, I live up by Maspinock. Um, there's a significant amount of standing water that I've never seen that's uh, persisted, you know, through last summer, the fall, and now the end of winter into the spring. I'm wondering um, what you may envision about potential change in mitigation strategies about, you know, springtime um, treatments or summertime treatments to keep the population of mosquitoes down that's environmentally friendly. Um, Lauren, Ann, would you like to answer first, please? Um, I, I'm sure you're familiar that there is a, pro, a current program out there um, that you can call the Central Mosquito, I think it's called, where you can actually call and they can come out and they can spray for free. They, can, they do your neighborhoods. And the Board of Health does sponsor uh, an event where it goes through the town in different neighborhoods. As far as mitigating or controlling that, I think uh, residents should if they keep on top of it or reach out to the Board of Health for additional services, I'm sure that they have different resources out there that could help mitigate some of those issues. Diana? Um, I'm not sure uh, what you mean by standing water, if, if you're talking about in the roads? Yeah. Okay. So um, there is, um, the government has put into effect the infrastructure bill, um, and I'm not sure where Milford stands with um, doing some roads and renovations within the town of um, uh, to, to prevent this from happening. I believe that the wetlands probably have 
some protection and those types of things would have to be looked into before they could make any changes in the wetlands as far as um, structurally changing the environment. I know the Board of Health does the yearly mosquito spraying and perhaps they would be, that would be something to look into as, as Laurie Ann said, to see what else is out there that the Board of Health could continue to do to help um, decrease the numbers in the area. Thank you. Um, anyone who has a question, please walk up to the microphone at any time. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to start, Tom and I will start asking questions that have come in from email. And the first one of these, many of the surrounding communities use a third party curbside composting service that is funded by individual participants, which has reduced the amount of waste going to landfills and incinerators by 30%. Given the benefits, would you consider using your position on the Board of Health to promote the availability of this service or to perhaps advocate for adding it to Milford's waste pickup service? Um, Diana, can you answer first, please? Um, I would have be honest with you, I would have to do research as to what the other towns are doing. As far as the compost, I can't say one way or the other if I would promote that um, or I would be against that. It, it does sound like something that would be of value to the residents. And however, if, um, as was brought up earlier, if people are having trouble with the um, trash pickup and the recycle pickup right now, um, we would probably want to ensure that compost that was picked up is not left or is not spread across the street or across the town because the compost itself is going to attract uh, insects, rodents, any type of um, bugs that could get into it and then that's going to be a, a source of spread of disease. So uh, it would be something to look into and research and as you say, see what the science says about it. Thank you. Lori Ann, could you respond please? I would have to agree um, exactly what Diana said. I, you know, we'd have to look into it, investigate it a little bit more to see if there are resources or what if the Board of Health or other town departments could take something on like that. Okay. They already have quite a bit to do. Great, thank you. Um, we're going to move on from trash to another uh, question through email. Uh, what can you tell us about the state's efforts to house migrants in Milford hotels? Does the Board of Health have a role? What are your thoughts on how this uh, is being handled? Uh, why don't we Lorianne start with Lorian? What I'm, what I know about the uh, the migrants that have moved in, um, I. I understand that they come in, um, there's quite a few of them that have been housed at a local hotel, um, and they do try to provide services. They look into providing them health care, uh, getting them into the schools. Uh, I'm not familiar what the Board of Health's role, um, exactly what they do as far as the migrants, but uh, I'm sure when they first come in, if there's, a, especially in the school system, um, trying to get them enrolled and getting supportive services for these families. I do know that the school reaches out quite a bit to the Board of Health to try to help them, assist with them. Thank you. Diana? Um, my understanding is that the migrants are housed across the Commonwealth and that the state is ultimately responsible that they have a nurse that goes out to the hotels and um, works with the families um, the, and works with the hotel. I don't know what the contract with the hotels is as far as that in the state. I believe the state is f providing funding for food um, to the uh, residents of the hotels. The Board of Health would become involved when it is a Board of Health issue. In other words, if there was, um, uh, say, a, a, a spread of disease or if the restaurant 
is it one of the things they do inspect as far as food handling? If they weren't handling the food properly, then they would um, be doing an investigation just like they would for any other um, uh, restaurant service in town. Um, I believe the Department of Public Health is tracking the immunizations for migrants because it became overwhelming for the towns to um, track because, you know, you, you can't always um, ensure that people are following up, shall we say, um, or understand, um, as I said, they have different norms within their countries and they may not see the relevance of these immunization. So I believe the state is working with the migrants in the hotels to ensure that they're in compliance. Thank you. Um, okay, another question from email. Back to trash and recycling. Um, but this has to do with the costs. So this resident wants to know, um, trash and recycling pickup costs continue to rise at an unsustainable rate. What ideas or plans do you have to stabilize the costs, and does this include new initiatives that don't require a renegotiation of the existing contract? And Diana, could you answer first, please? I'll be honest with you. I, I have not researched that topic. I do know that the contract does come up for renewal, and it's reviewed. Um, and I would anticipate that if the costs continue to rise, that the board would need to look at other contractors to, to pick up the trash. Um, I have not, um, I personally have, don't have any problems, so I, I've not really talked, thought to a lot about it, but I do understand what you're saying when um, the cost rises continuously and um, that the more people that we have in the town, that the more trash that we're going to produce. Lorianne. As I said earlier in my statement, I think one of the ways of uh, keeping down the cost of trash is uh, requiring these trash barrels. There's other towns, Hopedale, Upton, um, that do have these trash barrels, hopefully at no cost to the resident if we could negotiate something with the waste management company or a small fee. Um, as back in the day when we started recycling where I believe there were $5 for a recycling bin, I think at the time, or $10 that the Board of Health charged. Um, I think that would make a difference and try to keep down the cost of trash. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, uh, another question from email. Do you know what town departments the Board of Health coordinates with to minimize potential mental health issues? Do you think that enough is being done to address and assist mental health issues in Milford? Uh, if not, what changes or programming would you recommend? Uh, Lorianne, let's begin with you. I'm not too familiar. Um, just in my line of work and my previous line of work, I would have to say that uh, the Board of Health um, I would assume they would partner up with the VNA, the Department of Mental Health, uh, local school officials, school officials, excuse me, to try to deal with some of those issues. Thank you. Diana? Uh, a <clears throat> private resident, I would believe, who has insurance would be using the mental health services of the, um, that are contracted with their insurance. Um, there is the Kennedy, uh, Edward M. Kennedy um, Center in Milford for low income and um, uh, or um, people with no insurance. And I believe um, in looking at their website, they do provide mental health services. There's Riverside Community Health that um, takes on um, many of the um, lower income uh, residents that do not uh, have insurance and cannot seek a private counselor. 
I will say that because of the uptick in mental health problems that the services out there are really um, not limited, but there um, a lot of them are at capacity that people um, try to get their children in to be seen. Um, my daughter is a school adjustment counselor and she talks to me frequently about the, the cases that she sees. She's not in Milford, so I can't speak to Milford, but I, I think it's probably the same across all um, the school systems and trying to get these children into um, private counseling is difficult. It's, it's just, it's, they're at max capacity. So um, they do have adjustment counselors in all the schools. And um, I believe that they work closely with the students um, and with the parents to the best of their ability, but they are not mental health counselors and don't do Thank mental you. health counseling. Thank you. I'm sorry. I, I hate to cut you off. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, we have time for one more question. Um, is there anybody in the room who would like to go to the microphone? If not, we're going to pose one more question from email. Um, this is a little bit different. There have been citizen concerns regarding the current chicken and fowl regulations. Should the current regulation be changed? And if so, how would you change it? And um, so, Diana, you go first on this one, please. I can be honest with you. I don't know exactly what the chicken and fowl <laughs> regulations are. I do know that people are allowed to have chickens um, and maintain the chickens in the yards. I believe that they, are, they probably have to um, contain them so that they're not um, sort of flying around. And I believe that people are probably, I, I know someone from another town who has a chicken coop in her backyard and is raising chickens and they produce a lot of eggs. And I probably with the economic environment out there, they're doing that for a reason, to help reduce um, the cost of buying eggs or maybe they just like having chickens, but um, <laughs> I, I can't speak to the current um, regulation. Uh, if there's a, that person would like to um, give their email, I would be glad to look into it and get back to them. But um, okay. thank I you, Lori. Uh, there is a current regulation. Uh, it's actually governed by the building department's zoning bylaw. Um, back in the day when I was working for the town, um, chickens were not allowed. That was one of my worst things. I used to chase chickens all the time. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. In the years past, they have changed a lot and some chickens are allowed, but it's very specific. Um, but it is governed by the zoning, so I don't really feel that it's <clears throat> an issue um, in regards to Board of Health. Um, I feel it's more of a zoning issue. Okay. We have reached the end of our time for the Board of Health segment. I want to thank you both, Diana and Lori Ann, for participating tonight and sharing your thoughts about public health and your goals for the Milford Build Board of Health. Everyone, if we could please give them both a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, we would now like to ask the candidates for school committee to come up to the table.
Oh, All right. Thank you. Let's uh, thank you. let's begin. Yeah, here she comes. It's okay. Okay. Uh, the four uh, the four candidates for three seats on the Milford School Committee are Greg Allegreza, uh Megan Hornberger, Christopher Wilson, and Matthew uh, Zacchelli. 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 That's it. That was a test. Um, <laughs> Greg, Greg is challenging the three incumbents, uh, Megan, Christopher, and Matthew. Uh, we welcome Greg, Megan, Chris, and Matt to tonight's forum. Uh, we're going to begin with opening statements. Uh, earlier, the order of the candidates uh, was determined, and uh, we're going to begin with Greg. If you could, uh, please give your opening statement. currently married. I have uh, three kids, two older kids uh, in South Carolina and um, one daughter that is going to be going into the sixth grade, which is really my impetus for running. Um, my belief is that education is the foundation of future success. So with oh. I'm loud already, so I really don't need a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> so with that being said, um, I think the role of the public school system is to round out our students, make them resilient, um, form them so they can become better productive members of society. Um, my goal is to, is to take a, put a magnifying lens on policies, procedures, and line items that I think um, need looking at to see if they uh, contribute to the, the, the quality of the, of the school system. So it, I want to look at them under the lens and say, the, how does this improve the quality of the Melbourne school system? I'd like to commend the other three candidates running. Um, I was told that uh, it doesn't take just one year on the school committee. It takes a full term to really get a handle on everything that, that you really need to know. So I hope everyone provides me a little grace with being the new guy on the, on the stage, you know, with the three incumbents. So um, I know it's, not a, it's, it's an important job in town. And... Uh, I hope that yeah, I, I'll, I'll get your, uh, your vote. Great, thank you. And now, Matt, please give your opening statement. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, yes, uh, so my name is Matthew Zakili. I'm also a lifelong resident of, of Milford. My wife, Victoria, and I have three children in, uh, in Milford as well. We have our two oldest at Brookside and uh, in Woodland. Along with being a first-term school committee member, I'm also a town meeting member and a volunteer coach with Milford Hope Dill Youth Soccer. Um, on the professional side, I'm a consulting engineer with a Cisco Systems partner. I've been there for about 10 years, and I've been in IT for about 23 now. So um, Greg's right. It feels like it takes a whole term to figure out what's going on, what the regulations are, and, and get your feet under you. Um, three years ago, I ran following in uh, the footsteps of generations of my family to give back to our town directly, and uh, it has been very fulfilling. It's been an, an exciting and energetic three years. It's been a long three years in certain ways as well. Um, but I do believe that, um, that my work is, is really just getting underway, especially with the, uh, the progress of an MSBA project with Milford High School. So I do believe that the committee is in the middle of some very big critical discussions right now, um, ones that will have an impact on Milford Public Schools for years, if not decades to come. And that's why I believe that experience gained for me over the last three years is, is critical in seeing those conversations through, uh, not just the ones that are on the table now, but the many that are coming our way. In, in the next six and 12 months. So that's why I'm here running for a second term, and that's why I'm asking for votes from, uh, from everybody. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Matt. Uh, and now, Chris, please give your opening statement. Thank you. Uh, good evening, and thank you for the citizens of Milford for hosting tonight. Uh, again, my name is Chris Wilson. I'm the current chairman of the Milford School Committee, and I'm seeking re-election. Uh, I'm a 20-plus year resident of this community. Um, I'm, I live here with my wife, Kathy, and we've raised our two kids here. My son, Ryan, is a 2022 a graduate of uh, Milford High School, and my daughter is uh, an upcoming graduate of Milford High School this coming spring. Professionally, I'm a senior mechanical engineer with a local technology firm, um, and then I'm also a planning board member, and I'm a town meeting member. Uh, so certainly just looking to continue my role on school committee. Uh, the lessons learned over these past six years, uh, as Matt has just indicated, we, you know, we've, we've got some 
budget implications that we're, we're working through, and we also have a new school or a renovation on the horizon. So again, just looking to continue and utilize my experience. So hoping for everybody's vote on April 2nd. Great, thank you. And uh, last but not least, uh, Megan, if you could please give your opening statement. Absolutely, thank you, Tom. Thank you, citizens from Milford for hosting us this evening. Certainly thank you to Milford TV for allowing this to be broadcast. Thank you everyone for being here. My name is Megan Hornberger and I was born and raised in Milford. I'm also a proud Milford Public Schools alum, having graduated in the class of 1995. I also graduated from Providence College and Northeastern University. Together with my husband, Brant, I'm raising three boys in Milford who currently attend Memorial Elementary, Woodland Elementary, and Milford High School. Hmm. I've been volunteering in our school district since my now 16-year-old was in kindergarten. I serve as the Memorial PTO president and on the Memorial and Woodland School Councils prior to being elected to the school committee six years ago. I am also a town meeting member. In my time on the committee, I've had opportunity to serve as vice chairperson and chairperson. Professionally, I am a certified public accountant in Massachusetts with over two decades of experience and am currently employed by a Boston-based renewable energy company. The Milford Public School System represents the core of our community and the foundation of opportunity for our children. The Milford schools offer an inclusive environment for children to learn, explore, and develop their whole selves. Curriculum and extracurriculum programming produce students who excel in academics, the arts, athletics, and music. We are blessed with dedicated, compassionate educators and administrators, two of whom I see here this evening, who are working hard to challenge our students. All residents benefit when students are prepared for success and learning opportunities are maximized. Our district is not without its challenges. I hope to be one of the individuals working to solve these issues. I have demonstrated my commitment and dedication in this role in my two terms. I'm a hard worker and active collaborator. I have been open-minded and engaged as a school committee member. It has been an honor to serve this community, and I respectfully ask for the opportunity to continue in this role. Please cast one vote for Megan Hornberger on April 2nd. Great, thank you to each of you. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so now we are going to move on to the challenge question segment of the school committee portion of the forum. It works a little bit differently for the school committee than it did for the Board of Health. Each candidate will pose one question to any or all of their opponents. And the opponents will have two minutes to respond. The questioner will have one minute to rebut if you desire. Other candidates will also have one minute to jump in if you would like to chime in on the topic of, that's being questioned. We will alternate the questions so that all four of you have an opportunity to pose one challenge question. So we're going to do this in the same order as the opening statements. So Greg, you're first, and if you don't mind, let us know to whom you're directing your question and then pose the question. Sure, it's more, more for, uh, for everybody. Uh, given the, the okay. status of uh, the exorbitant cost of college now, and a um, lot, of, lot of companies are not really focused on, I, th I think the, in the future, they're not gonna be focused on maybe hiring college graduates because with, with, the, uh, with how expensive it is and kids should have more opportunity to explore uh, different avenues um, vocationally. And I know there's, there's, a, there's a couple of programs, but uh, I'm just wondering if you would be on board with me in, in projecting, of course, budget you know, being our, our major limiting factor of uh, introducing some more vocational and you know, opportunities for, for the kids to, to explore things maybe outside that wouldn't necessarily go to college. Okay, so this question is for everybody. It is. So Matt, why don't you go first? Excellent, um, excellent question. I feel like you kind of set that one up for me nicely, so thank you. My pleasure. Okay, um, yes, yes, I absolutely would support that. I would, um, sorry, I absolutely would support that. It was something I was very excited about uh, three years ago. Uh, and it's something that's incredibly important in terms of um, what we're going through right now with the MSBA program. There's a portion of that process called Chapter 74 where we actually will, be, will visit the opportunities that we can bring into Milford High School that are considered vocational. Um, college attendance rates are dropping. 
college completion rates are worse. Um, just a, a quick stat, 62% uh, of people who start a four-year program since 2016 finish it in six years, and only about 65% ever finish it. Uh, a lot of it has to do with cost, and a lot of it has to do with our kids getting into programs that they don't even know if they like. If we can offer these programs, like vocational programs, number one, we can spark interest and direct where they're going to college, but we can also give training and knowledge and insight on what they can do with their lives in that three to five year window after high school, whether it's college or going into the workplace or whatnot. So I would absolutely support doing that in every way. Thanks. Okay, Chris? Thank you, yeah, certainly would support uh, the addition of uh, vocational programs. Six years ago when I first ran, one of the, uh, you know, my talking points was just that. Um, Unfortunately, after six years, have we expanded a lot? No, why? Because we don't have the space. Unfortunately, you know, Milford High School, if you walk through those halls, every little space, closet, classroom has been utilized. So, you know, we have also BBT, so we can't compete with any of their programs. So we've gotta be very careful. Um, but also, you know, there are some constraints as far as being able to expand these programs because we just simply don't have the space. One thing that we did do was a couple of years ago is we hired, we hired a guidance counselor specifically to help students that were going to go into, into industry, into the workforce. So we recognized that there was 20% of our graduating class that was not going on to college. So we wanted to support that demographic and we hired on again a, a um, a guidance counselor specifically to help them find jobs. Megan? Thanks, Greg. It's a great question, and I also really valued how you approached it in terms of how could we collaborate on that, because as you well know, it is a team of seven and collaboration is key. I think it's critical. Um, I think particularly with the cost of college, one of our sort of components of our mission statement is lifelong success for these children. And so not success that you get into a program for four years that you have lifelong success. And so it absolutely should be something we're expanding on. Greg, is there anything you would like to say in response to the three answers that were provided? Uh, just one thing, I know uh, because of with the, with the new school coming into play, that would be something that we could potentially look into, like the space constraints would not necessarily be in, the, in place with the, with the new school coming in. So that'd be something that could definitely be looked into saying, okay, we're gonna do additional shop spaces for these, like you said, with the, with the constraints that we have from BVT and things like that. So I think that should be something we should look for at with the, with the new school. Okay, great. Um, Matt. Uh, yeah, so my question is for everybody again, and, and this is really open-ended, so um, go for it. My, my question is, what do you feel is the biggest challenge that we're facing as a district on the budget front? Okay, so your question is for everybody. So, Megan, I'll let you answer first, please. Sure. Uh, I guess in my mind, Matt, there's sort of two components. There's short-term and long-term. So long-term is the funding of our new rebuilt Milford High School. So that will be incredibly critical because that number is so big. So that's one. In the near term, it's addressing the sort of shortage, if you will, of Chapter 70. We expected a much bigger percent aid from the state, which we are not getting. And so in the near term, it's figuring out how are we going to close that gap. And I think it's working collaboratively with administration, with the Finance Committee, and with the town, and figuring out where potentially other right areas to pause, pull back a little bit uh, as we move forward next year. Okay. Greg, why don't you go next, please? Um, Megan sort of stole my thunder, but uh, <laughs> I think that's, it, it's sort of self-explanatory. Um, re, re, repeat that again. Sure. So the question is, what do you think our biggest challenges are in terms of budget-wise? Budget yeah. So as Megan has stated, uh, I think we projected to get seven or eight million. The last couple of years, we've gotten like seven million dollars as a, as a, at the town. And this year, it was knocked down to two. So I know the school committee had worked on a whole bunch of uh, new things that they wanted to install into the, into the school. And they basically had to cut almost all of them out, which is, which is you know, a, it, it's, a, it's a rough thing, but money sort of runs everything. And that, that puts more of a burden onto the town. Um, repeat that, yeah, I keep losing my train of thought. No, that's it, that's really just, it's just what, are, what are we, what's our biggest focus right now budgetarily? What's our biggest okay. challenge with? Yeah, and then, they, then, then, then the new school, so. From what I've heard, a, a, a new school could be anywhere from 280 to like $500 million. So the, the overall outlay from the town is, is probably gonna be, you know, something that is, is unfeasible. So that's why we have a feasibility study that's gonna have to happen. And I think the recommendation from them, which is the most fiscally responsible part that would go for the townspeople, is what, what we should do. Obviously everybody would like a new school, but we'll have to see what they say in the end. So that's what I think. Okay, Chris, your response? Yeah. Uh, 
Um, I think obviously, yeah, as Meg had stated, there's short term, long term. Short term really is our current budget and the loss of uh, millions of dollars through Chapter 70 and what the local impact is going to be on our taxpayers. Sorry about that. Uh, you know, certainly there was a host of new initiatives that we had, you know, sat down for six hours on the first Saturday in January and, and we talked through them and we were very hopeful to push forward these new initiatives that are just overall from, from pre-K up to grade 12 are going to just improve the district overall. Unfortunately, when we got those Chapter 70 numbers, which is the state aid to help a community like ours that's very diverse, we lost millions of dollars. Millions of dollars was cut from that. So we as the school committee had to go back and basically slash all those new initiatives that we were hoping to put forth for our community and our students. Uh, there's certain ones that we still went with that are compliance issues. So by law, we needed to kind of staff up certain areas. But uh, certainly, uh, that is one of the biggest issues because there are, you know, we want to increase our, our literacy programs more than anything. We're seeing that needs a, uh, a good bump and good push from our MCAS side. And we still want, again, our, our, our math and our history and our social studies and our sciences. Okay, so Matt? Everybody has answered your question. Do you have anything you would like to add? Uh, yeah, so so one thing I would add, as, as they've all stated, you know, short term is where my focus is right now. Um, just to kind of put it in percentages, after that first six to eight hour session, we had an increase in about 12, 12.8% 12 in new initiatives. And the state came and gave us a 4% chapter 70 amount, which is not even a cost of living raise in terms of rolling over what we do this year to next year. So. Um, it was hard to erase everything that we wanted to do to move the district forward. But I also think it was very important to do. Um, and, and it's important to do it because we owe it to the taxpayers and to the town to make sure that, number one, we're being fiscally responsible with everybody's money. Um, so the process we're at right now is to see what we can remove. And then I think the next challenge is going back to the table with what it is we can fit in and comfortably ask the town for to keep us moving forward because in my mind it's not acceptable to put the brakes on simply because the state aid is not going to be high enough. Um, but also we can't come to the town and ask for seven million dollars in additional funding from the taxpayers because that is not acceptable in my opinion either. Okay. Um, Chris, it's time for you to pose your question to... Yeah, it also is to, uh, to everybody. Oh, okay. <laughs> one particular person. So, uh, so basically, you know, you have kind of executive powers. Is there one, any one particular policy that you would like to see move forward within the district for a beneficial standpoint? Oh, Greg, I'll have you go first, please. Uh, not being intimately, uh, not having intimate knowledge with all the policies and procedures, because I'm not on the school committee right now. I'd like to just revisit the. Um, if, if there's a policy regarding the, uh, the, the amount of um, English learners that can be in, in classrooms, you know, because with, with the influx of the new English learners, and I learned something today, so I, I'd, I'd like to say that, you know, going through this process, it, it's, been a, it's been a good learning process. You learn more every day, so it, I don't know what I don't know, let's put it that way. But um, I know that um, for each classroom, the state mandates that there's English learning ELL teachers that are in those classrooms. So the teachers themselves can't really, they, they, they won't teach in like the native language of those, of, of those students. So they have English learner teachers that have to be hired in order to teach these, which I, I didn't know before. I didn't know if they were just interpreters in there, but they're not, the English learner teachers. So with the reduction in the uh, cost, that sort of puts a strain on that. But I've heard from multiple parents that there are, some classes have a majority of English learning students and the traditional students are sort of suffering because of this because they, the flow in the classrooms is slowed down because they have to translate into two or three uh, languages and the, the English students are sort of, their learning is, is being affected that way. So I'm just wondering if there's any policy that dictates the percentage that can be in those classes. Okay. Megan, could you respond next please? So we don't have any, currently have a policy. Uh, we do have as a contractual requirement to keep class sizes at a certain level, and so that's something we work incredibly hard to do. Uh, one role of the school committee is not dictating or controlling or in any way influencing the students that show up at our doors, and so our moral, ethical, legal obligation is to educate all of them, and so we're working to find the best manner to service all of our students. 
Okay, and Matt, um, would you like to respond? Yeah, yeah. So the what? Nice break. So the policy that that I'd be referring to again leans towards the policy that, that is our budget that drives the district. And and one thing that I'd love to see I've heard from people about, and I know we're working on it now, is getting more of a um, dual language classroom setup rolling out. I know that they have it in Millis. I believe that they've had it in Mendon as well. It's incredibly successful to be teaching our students in multiple languages at once. It's something that I believe we were initially hoping to do next year at the kindergarten level. Obviously, that's been removed. Um, but the discussion is there. And it would be great in terms of the, the guiding policy that essentially is our budget to be able to filter some of our, our tax dollars into creating programs that keep our kids integrated with each other learning from each other and growing together because there, there has been quite a bit from DESE and from you know national education standards that show that when you keep kids included and together, they do learn really well. Chris, do you have any comments based on? Yeah, just based on that question that I had was to just try to see what policies, you know, people might be um, thinking are going to betterment the the school community and just want to say that one that recently came to my attention and we just had the director of, of uh, social emotional learning come in and just the stress to our students and, 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 and our staff so I, I recently learned that a, a school district here in Massachusetts actually has a policy where they don't have homework during certain periods of time whether that's from Thanksgiving to Christmas or maybe like one weekend a month or one week uh, during a month so I think that when we look at the stress that we're putting on our students and our staff, I think that if we could develop a policy or, or if I could institute a policy right now, I would work to try to minimize that stress and that would be through just time frames of no homework. So, thank you. Okay. Okay, great. All right, Megan, the last challenge question is from sure. you. Thanks, Jerry. <laughs> uh, so Revlet, running for public office uh, can be a little intimidating, and so I'm very empathetic, Greg, to sort of being the one sitting at this table that doesn't have the experience that, of the hours that we put together. So my question is sort of going to just take a little bit of a spin and not kind of rely on that knowledge to be I, answered. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Your question is, is to just, everyone. Just it's to everyone, oh, but everyone. to level okay. the playing field in okay. terms of what I'm okay. asking. I missed that. Thank you. Um, obviously, it's a team of seven. I'm curious what each of you think you bring to the table in terms of an, a skill that's valuable for the success of the group. Okay. Greg, I'll have you go first. Uh, sure. Um, recently, I had served on the um, police chief's committee as one of the uh, town members. And uh, I had said this, if anyone had watched the, uh, the, 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 the meetings, um, it went from about January to about August. And it was an overview, a very diverse like, group of people. Not all had the same uh, political leanings or thoughts or, you know, but I think the collaboration on that on that committee was such that everybody was working towards the same goal, which was to find the best police chief in town. And as an engineer for 24 years, I went to WPI and I have a mechanical engineering degree. I've been working uh, in the pharmaceutical industry for 24 years. I work with teams all the time, and I have to work with you know whether it's the mechanics or the uh, the guys on the floor or the managers, and we all have to work in collaboration. So I've been involved in doing that. In, when it comes to improving the school system, I think politics aside, like I was saying before, it's to put the lens on what's, what do we look at that can improve the quality of the, of the education in town. That's the main, that should be the main driver of everybody on the, uh, on the school committee, and I think I can bring that to the school committee. Okay, great. Matt, could you go next, please? Sure, so um, for me, it's integrity and it's problem solving. Um, my fellow engineers up here will know that that having a, an engineer's mindset to problem solving is a blessing at times and it's absolutely a curse at times as well. Um, I'm, I'm very good at listening and understanding, identifying the problems that are in front of us and then systematically creating a way to get to a solution. Um, not always the fastest way to get there as an engineer because you can't help but step on every single step along the way and try to so sort everything out. But I think that that actually lends positively to the school committee because um, like many things in the municipal world, nothing goes very quickly. So you do have the time to discuss thoroughly and see things through. So um, those skills, I believe, have been the most beneficial to me over the last three years. Chris? Thank you. Um, I think the best skill set that I've learned over my past six years is just learning to listen, you know, and, and reaching out to people so I can get that information. You know, there's certainly, there, there are students, there are staff, there are administrators, in in each person, each individual has a different mindset, you know, whether it's a kindergarten teacher 
or a grade 12 teacher or somewhere in between in, in the administration at, at the five different schools. So being able to listen to them, hear what they may have for problems, what they are asking for solutions, I think being able to hear that, understand that is, is a way of developing over my six years of, of, of policy and budget. Okay, Megan, would you like to respond to any of the comments? I would thank you to my fellow candidates for answering my question. <laughs> uh, personally, I think I'm hardworking and resourceful, and I think all of the attributes that were mentioned would be really valuable to the committee, so thank you. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, uh, it's uh, now time for the Milford voters uh, to ask questions of the school committee candidates. Uh, we invite anyone with a question to please walk up to the standing microphone at any time. Members of the audience and candidates, please keep in mind the ground rules uh, for asking and answering questions. We're going to repeat them since we have some new residents that have uh, joined us. Members of the audience, please limit your questions to 30 seconds. Candidates, please try to respond with an answer that is no longer than two minutes. Questions can be directed to one particular candidate or to all three candidates. If a question is directed to one candidate, he or she will have two minutes to respond and the other candidates will have one minute to comment. The candidate who answers initially will have one minute to rebut. The moderators reserve the right to extend the answer time if needed. And importantly, members of the audience, please be considerate when stating your question. Each candidate has supporters in the room. Be respectful, avoid personal attacks. We reserve the right to dismiss an, an intrusive or inappropriate question and to cut off any political statements uh, and to move on. Um, so thank you. Finally, as a reminder to the folks watching at home, please submit your questions uh, now by Facebook Messenger, email, text, or by phone calls shown on the screen. We will try to pose as many of your questions as possible. Let's begin. If you'd like to ask a question, please approach. Oh, we got somebody approaching. All right. We do. Uh, David? So, so this is for everybody. Uh, I'm a lifelong resident of Milford. I don't have any kids in the school system. I have four grandchildren. I have nieces and nephews that have children in the school system. Uh, as you might have heard earlier, my daughter is a student counselor. And over the last, she's now on her third job in eight years. And every place she's been to, uh, they don't have the, enough faculty to handle the school system. And mental health and children has become just, it's exploded. You know, social media is making a mess. And so I'm just wondering where you guys see how you can improve on the faculty of the mental health system in the school. Because from my understanding is uh, there isn't enough. And the ones that are there are being overburdened with uh, too many students. And when you, just like a teacher, if you have too many students, it's tough to teach them all student counselor, you have, you know, too many students that have problems, it's tough to give them the time that they need to, to try and get through that. So. Great. Thank you for the question, David. Megan, why don't we start with you? Thanks for the question. You are 100% spot on. We have a mental health crisis in this country, and we do not have enough people supporting it. Uh, we actually just had a presentation at our last school committee meeting from the Director of Social Emotional Learning. Mrs. Kincaid, I would highly encourage you to go and watch it because she really went through and highlighted all of the programs. Uh, that position has actually been put in place since I joined the committee, and it was sort of shocking to me to think back to a time where we didn't have that role. Um, a lot of times we'll get questions about the safety of our schools, and a lot of that work and where I think we are today with our district, for me, comes back to the work that we're doing with mental health because I think that is so critical for our students. Um, we, we are working very hard to have that support in all the buildings, uh, supporting all of our students. An, another challenge is the language barrier. And so, you know, any hire that we make now, we're looking to make that hire bilingual to support our students. But it is absolutely a challenge and a concern and something we're regularly addressing. Great. Thank you. Uh, Chris? Thank you. Yeah, just to build on what Megan had just said, we're, you know, certainly we're bolstering our social emotional learning department as, as much as we can. Um, you know, but when you think about it, right, there's, it's 365 days a year. We have the students for only 180. There are 24 hours in a day. We only have them for six hours a day. So we put a lot of emphasis on our staff to basically be that mental health 
professional, right? And along with teaching the basics of education. Um, so how do you get there? How do you support those students? And, and that's a really difficult thing from my seat because with to put more supports is more money and more money is more burden on the taxpayers. So where is that balance? And I think it's, it's a very difficult balance here where I sit, but I certainly know that it's something that I want to support our staff members and ultimately want to support the students that are within the school system because if they're not ready to learn, if they come to school and, and they're thinking about a situation that happened at home and they can't focus on learning, they're not going to learn throughout the day. You know, so, um, and it's that fine line between what's happening at home and what can our school do to support that. Uh, so certainly our teachers and our staff do the best that they can um, and we support them in any way that we can. Um, you know, so our social emotional learning director will come to us with initiatives and we hope to do more and more throughout uh, each budget cycle. Great, thank you, Chris. Matt? That's a great question. Um, barriers are something that get discussed a lot in terms of students' ability to effectively and efficiently learn. And, and some of the barriers that have come up, especially over the last uh, handful of years, attendance is one. We've put attendance officers in place to try to address that. Um, food insecurities is another. A lot of people may not know we have 272 children marked as, as homeless in this district right now. Um, the state of Massachusetts has stepped up to provide meals twice a day during the school year. Um, and, and mental health is another one. Just because we get the kids fed and get them there doesn't mean that they're there mentally, as Chris noted. There, there's any number of, of things that can be taking a child's attention away from their learning. Um, having counselors in place is helpful. We certainly need more, but um, this crisis has, has really driven what has created social and emotional learning to spill more into the classroom and fall more on our regular teachers to spend some time with it. Um, they have our kids roughly for half the time they're awake five days a week. So I don't think it's right to expect them not to be there socially and emotionally for our students, but also at the same time, you know, their focus is the core curriculum and the education that they have to provide through math and, and science and social studies and all that stuff. So. We do need to continue to focus, um, especially in the budget world, to support Ms. Kincaid's department and to bring in as many as we can um, to help with this because I think it's pretty obvious at this point that, that, that these needs are not going to go away, so we do need to work harder to try to work this into the budget as we move forward. Great, thank you. Uh, Greg? I'm going to take a little different tact on, on, uh, on this. Um, mental health is, is obviously uh, an issue and going back to your, your statement about the social media and everything when, when kids get certain age they're exposed to a lot of, a lot of stuff now that really like when we were growing up going to school we were never exposed to all this stuff and it's stuff that it's and it's subjects that are more mature than really what they should be doing for me I don't think they should be any, they shouldn't have any any access to like cell phones or whatever in school because it takes away from them. I think there needs to be a set of expectations when kids go to school uh, from you, you, the, the teachers need to have a set of expectations from the parents saying, okay, the kids should go to school. You talked about absenteeism. They need to be in class. There should be an expectation on how they sh they're supposed to be behave in class. There should be expectations from the teachers on how the kids and the parents expect the, them to behave. And if they are not behaving that way and it's distracting from the whole class, there has, there has to be a way for the teachers to remain that respect and authority in the classroom where they're able to deal with the, the, the problem in sort of, you know, remove it from the classroom and figure out why. Now, when it comes to social emotional learning, uh, I just listened to a podcast and, uh, on, and with uh, Abigail Schreier. So she wrote a book. It's called Bad Therapy. And it says, Why Our Kids Aren't Growing Up. Now, a lot of the social emotional learning, my thoughts of social emotional learning is thinking that, okay, um, it's how to sort of deal with your emotions, how to relate to other kids. What they're doing, what a lot of it's going is, is they're going into class and they're ruminating, making kids ruminate over something. Say, oh, think about something that made you sad that day. And going to Chris's point, how is that going to help a kid with a math test later on? So her point was that a lot of this, we need to make resilient kids. Like when we were kids, something happened. Like you're going to have disappointments. You're going to fail. You have to teach kids how to fail because they're going to fail in life. We, we all want to protect our kids to the utmost, but sometimes Kids are resilient. They'll, they'll be able to get over that. And, and I think 
the schools are sort of, and the teachers are stepping in areas where it's best left to the parents. Thank you, Greg. Um, no, all, all four responded. Oh, yes. one minute response, yeah. Yes. I just wanted to add to your question, one thing that we do do every year as part of the budget process is look at caseloads for these workers uh, in the same way that we look at class size. Um, and while I would prefer that that number was always lower, I would love a class size of eight that would not be fiscally responsible. And so we do look to the experts, which are the building principals, to bring us their priorities. Uh, and we've worked really hard uh, to fund the priority requests that they bring us. Thank you. Uh, do we have additional questions? Can you hear me? Do it, do it, just stand Almost. up like this. <laughs> um, I, uh, I don't have it written down, so it's, I'm not going to be quite as articulate as if I were to read the question, but in terms of, you know, social and emotional well-being, um, we always look to counselors, we look to therapists, we look to teachers, we look to parents, um, and it's, it, you know, usually directed at what's going on with the child. I would propose that perhaps you do some research, the people that are on the school committee, into community emotional well-being, things like, uh, and we have a great music department. My, I raised three, we, my husband and I raised three boys, and they all went through the Milford school system. Um, they were, two of them were involved in music, and one to the nth degree. And it, so if the music department is still intact, as I remember, it's strong and robust, you know, it, I would suggest you do some research into things like community songwriting or drum circles where you get together and you you say everybody's going to how are you feeling today I'm mad as hell mm -hmm. you know or whatever and you're you're reaching the students but you're also it's it's therapy for the teachers as well for the counselors as well there are groups that are available they do it for the vets they do it you know for students I'm actually involved in a group that does community songwriting at college campuses to address stress um, amongst the students and help them to deal with anxiety. Um, we just did a program at WPI where students just come in, they walk in, they're just walk-ins, no commitment. We sometimes have, we usually have food because that attracts college students. Um, and they just sit down and we have a person that, you know, is a, is a good musician, a really good musician. He's from Rhode Island. I'm, I'm so, I'm so and, sorry to interrupt. I'm sorry. Okay. I, I'm just wondering, what, what's the question? It, it, that, no, it was it, no question. It was just a suggestion as a follow-up. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. So okay. I can talk so, to you more about the resources yes. that I'm available. Sorry. <laughs> mm -hmm. you, you know me, Jim. <laughs> it's, it's okay. It's Thank okay. You. Is there anybody? Oh. I'd like to address that. Um, it's okay. Sure. I think so. I, it, yes. We'll we'll let, give everybody if everybody yeah. would like to yeah. respond um, to her statement. Sure, yeah. Greg, you can start. I, I think a lot of those ideas are, are really good. I think it, it probably has to, uh, it, it would be better um, set towards certain age groups, right? So when the kids like kindergarten or going through, like I was talking about, a lot of the, it, it, in the school, school should be a place where they, they feel safe and they, and they have fun going. Like I used to love going to school. Like we would, I, I think what happened was we've sort of taken things away, like the horribles parade or dressing up at Halloween or giving out Valentine's. And I'm not sure why, why we did that because it gives kids something, something to look forward to. And I think a, a five-year-old, the difference between a five-year-old thinking about his feelings when he just wants to play outside or do blocks and a high school kid when they're going through a lot of stuff, they're going through a lot of hormones and puberty and, and they have peer pressure and all things like that. I think something like that would be great. And I also think getting outside, being an outdoorsman myself and hunting and fishing and there's nothing better for a kid or anybody than to be outside. You don't have to be a sportsman. Just walk in the woods and just sit there. Mother Nature can cure a lot of ills for a lot of people. Okay. So I agree with you in some ways, but I think we have to sort of tailor it to maybe certain age groups, you know? Um, Matt, Chris, Megan, would you like to respond at all? Yeah, quickly, I'll just say that we are working in some ways towards that. Um, some may not be aware, but uh, Woodland has a program called Girls on the Run. It's an after-school program where um, our students get together with some coaches and they do get exercise, they get outside, they burn some energy, but it's also about some social emotional stuff. It's a lot about dealing with anxiety and some of the challenges that hit those middle school kids. Um, and it's actually cool to find out that the Woodland group this year is so large, it's the largest in Worcester County and there was a wait list. It's something that um, I think is a great thing to offer and I, I agree with you. Looking into other opportunities, especially after school opportunities that students can enroll in and and leverage your time for is, is a great idea. So I, certainly if you could share some stuff with us, that would be excellent. Chris or Megan, anything? Please. Yes. Um, 
Well, first, I think that we have a future candidate next year. We might see you here with those great <laughs> ideas. So, she is uh, retired. So, <laughs> <laughs> Never. Uh, but, you know, certainly those are great ideas. I think to, to build upon what we did a couple years ago was we got rid of our, uh, sport, our activity fees, right? So we're trying to really promote those after-school activities. Uh, and we felt that one of the best promoting ways was to make them free of charge. So, again, that's just another way of trying to have students be able to access outlets after school free of charge. Megan. So first off, I just want to say that I love that you mentioned community because I think our district has a lot of challenges and I think a lot of times we forget those are community challenges and I think the more we can collaborate in general with our community, the more successful we're going to be. Um, I love when I see towns that have their youngest learners with their senior citizens. Like I think there's so much potential so I would love to see that expanded. Uh, I, I didn't appreciate before I came this evening how appropriate it was that we were here on the same night as the Board of Health in terms of how we're all navigating this. Um, mm -hmm. I did want to thank you for your service as a nurse and you know certainly running is great but even volunteering we'd love to hear great ideas and find a way to put them into action. Okay. Okay. And so I think we have somebody back at the mic. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, Mike Visconti, resident of Milford. Uh, my question is for Ms. Hornberger. However, I would like the other candidates to comment also. Uh, question is, shortly after Woodland School was built, I expressed to you my concern that there was no comprehensive preventive maintenance schedule plan in place to maintain not only the new Woodland School, but any of our other school buildings. A couple months. Three months later, maybe, you did respond in writing, and in your written response, you said that you are not concerned that there is no preventive maintenance plan for our schools and other infrastructure, which I think sends a message to the taxpayers that you are okay with taking $31 million for the Woodland School and possibly hundreds of millions of dollars for a new high school. Okay, okay. Why, why don't we let her address the question that you just posed? Well, what was the question? Well, I, 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 was, I, was, I was getting to that. Oh, okay, was, yeah, get, all right. Get to the point. Yeah. But if you're shutting me off, you're shutting me off. Are you shutting um, me I'm off? sorry, I thought there was a question, but um, well, we, we there, need there to be was, careful the about the, the tone the of the question. The question a little more um, involved. The, 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 the question, it continues, if you will. And, okay, it can't well, be too long, Mike. The, 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 Ms. Hornberger, do you understand the question? No. Would you like me to respond? Well, I didn't ask the okay, question. Right, My exactly. question is, I, how do you, can you comment on how you can explain to the voters and the taxpayers how you are okay with taking millions of their dollars and lighting it on fire? Thank you. Thanks for that question. Uh, I apologize. I do not recall that email. I, I will go back and check because that doesn't feel like to me something I would say. Uh, I would certainly look to my uh, peers on the committee now who I've spent a lot of hours in budget meetings with where I think I have been fairly accountable, uh, transparent, and asking a lot of questions about our money. Uh, the one thing that I can offer to you, Michael, is that we actually quite recently had a complete overhaul of our facilities department. Uh, you probably want to watch the meeting next week to learn a little bit more about that. Uh, but I assure you I have been diligent with the funds that our town has given us. Chris, um, would you like to respond? Yeah, I'll, sure. I'll just go down the table. Yeah, um, as Meg just specified that, you know, we have a new facilities director in place. And this new facilities director um, has, has gone through all of our five buildings and has and started to create very such plan. Um, I certainly will, will say that we were uh, behind on that, Mike. Um, you know, and we are catching up. And, and it is a big, very big focus. Uh, Matt and I both serve on the uh, facilities subcommittee. And it has become a, a, a major focus to us. Um, you know, the, the last two graduation commencement speeches included um, some, some kind of some pokes at Milford High School and having to walk through with an umbrella on rainy days on the inside. So we took that to heart, right? Like, that, they may have poked fun out of it, but we as school committee members felt that we were not providing a good school environment for them. And that's why our direction and our focus became on facilities 
and that's why we have a new facilities director who knows that is our focus. Matt. Thank you for that question, Michael. Um, when I started three years ago, there wasn't one. Um, but a year ago, I became annoyed enough with our state of our facilities that I, I'm pretty sure I pestered Chairman Wilson hard enough to put me on the facilities subcommittee so that I could voice these in a, in a more appropriate um, a forum. So the good news, as he stated, is that we have been very focused on getting something like this created. We are working with, um, with our facilities director. Um, we just had a meeting a couple weeks ago talking about this very thing. They have started a comprehensive um, review of all of our facilities. That's the start of building an actual physical, not in somebody's head, but an actual documented maintenance plan on how we stay ahead of a lot of our schools, especially Woodland with the high-tech uh, incorporation over there. People think that because it's more technologically advanced that there's less you have to do. It's actually worse because there's way more stuff to break that these guys build. So um, so that's, that's coming. And uh, I believe the good news is we have a little bit of an extra push behind us because not only is, is the subcommittee and the committee pushing it, but the MSBA, I believe, requires it as part of the phase one of the, the project for the high school. So there will be one coming. Greg. Yeah, Mike, that was a good question. Um, I just had my boiler guy come today, clean out my boiler. As you know, if you have an oil boiler, you're supposed to get it cleaned out every year. In the pharmaceutical industry, we have PMs on all the, all the equipment. It's either a six month or a, a yearly PM. Yes, yes. It depends. You go for the year, so it's so it's good. <laughs> but it's true. So PM, PM is something that is, ext is extremely important. It is, 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 is also one of, one of the reasons I was running is to sort of be an advocate and a voice for people that do have those type of questions. Because I had some questions that you know I, I feel that weren't particularly addressed. So I want to be able to be that voice for the people, the parent, whether it's a parent, whether it's a teacher or whether it's a student that might have a, a question on, on something that, you know, I'd like to be able to get back to them. But, but PM for, for the schools, and I also heard from uh, one of the parents of one of the teachers uh, uh, that the facilities, um, a complaint about the facilities of Memorial. And so it's good to hear that we have a new facilities director. It's super important because the kids have to stay in the facilities. So if they're dirty or if they're not clean or if the, if the HVAC system's not working well, if they have HEPA filters, then these systems, they, they could be creating uh, you know, a hazardous atmosphere for the kids. They're going to get respiratory illnesses and, and things like that. So it's, it's a good question. <laughs> All right. Do we, we have uh, other questions. Please come up to the mic. Otherwise, we'll move to the uh, email. My question, um, as part of the bid process for a new high school project, the M MSBA allows for additional funding through Chapter 74. Uh, do you support Chapter 74 funding and uh, why or why not? Thank you. Okay. Uh, Greg, why don't we begin with you? Um, not being fully versed on a Chapter 74 funding, I'm assuming it's more state funding that comes in because of the new school. Vocational funding. So it's vocational funding. Okay, so any type of money that would come in for vocational purposes, I would more than welcome it. I'm assuming it's a percentage depending on like need and, and, and things of that sort, right? So the maximum we can get to sort of bump up those programs, I say get it all. Okay, Matt. Great. So I, I absolutely support, I lost what you went, there you are. Uh, I absolutely support Chapter 74 uh, programs and, and just for everybody um, who may not know, Chapter 74 is a branch of the MSBA program that identifies uh, vocational programs. If you were to put a carpentry shop at the high school right now, a Chapter 74 program of new high school would, would mandate a specific floor plan with safety requirements and heat to ceiling heights and all the equipment that is necessary to provide these students a safe place to operate. And, and again, as I said uh, earlier, these types of programs in biomedical and engineering and all that stuff are, are absolutely critical to help give our kids an edge and to guide them into that, that period right after high school where they really start deciding which way they want to go with their lives. So I, I absolutely ex, um, support exploring it and adding as many as we can afford to add. Great. Uh, Chris? Yeah, certainly, again, yeah, I would support Chapter 74 110%. Um, as, as Matt had said, you know, expanding vocational programs within Milford Public Schools, the last numbers that I, that I knew of was 20% of our graduating class is going out 
into the industry, right? They're not going off to college. And, and also the, the other 80% might not necessarily make through those four years of college. So we've got to be able to prepare, you know, our students for the, what is beyond grade 12. So anything that we can do to expand those programs is going to be very beneficial. Again, uh, we're, we're a little bit uh, tight on space, so therefore we can't, we have a difficult time currently expanding those vocational programs. So therefore when we start looking at a high school and what that new phase will be, renovation, new, expanding upon it for allowing more vocational programs is going to be imperative. Great. And Megan? Sure. Yeah, thanks. It's a great question and 100%. Uh, I think the great news is that we'll be moving forward, uh, whether or not the three of us are on the committee, uh, as we move the MSBA process forward. So that is something that we're pursuing. Okay. Great. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? We're going to go to the email questions, but if you've got one, step up along the way as well. Anytime. Anytime. Is that good? Um, okay. So if one of the schools was about to hire a new principal, could you please describe what you believe the role of staff, students, and community would be in that process? So since we just went this way, let's mix it up a little bit, and Matt, we'll start with you. Uh, well, that's an excellent question, because last night, <laughs> no, two nights ago, Monday night, I sat on a hiring committee for a school that may be in town that's looking for a new principal. Um, school committee was involved, staff members were involved, there were multiple parents that were involved. Uh, central office was involved and it was a traditional um, hiring process asking questions of the candidates and essentially trying to figure out where we felt these folks that were applying stood in terms of providing our school community with the leadership that they that they need um, the school that we're talking about is Woodland I believe that's the, the Woodland community and the leadership at that school is potentially the best one that we have in town the communication is incredible the direction is very well known. The students know where they stand and what's expected of them. Uh, and for me, when I sat on that, uh, that committee on Monday night, I was looking for somebody who believed in those things, in, in setting expectations, in being firm in your decisions, whether or not people actually like what's being said, um, and being very well versed in communication with the students and the staff and the families. Now, tonight at the high school, there is an open public forum for the three finalists that were announced and that email was sent out. Um, to mm -hmm. everybody who has students in the district. So that is how the, the, um, the community gets involved. It was their opportunity to share every single question and thought that they had for these candidates to, uh, to kind of help vet that. I know a central office and administration was there as well to hear those, and, and they certainly will take that into consideration when they, uh, they make that decision. But it is important to know that hiring of a principal under, uh, under state legislation is directed um, to the superintendent only. So we have input, but it is the superintendent's ultimate decision. Okay. Chris? Thank you. Uh, yeah, the, the principal's role is so multifaceted. Um, you know, they are they are the true leader of that of that school. Um, they are the person that's going to oversee all the staff. They are the person that needs to ensure the the safety of every student and every staff member in there. They also need to oversee the curriculum that needs to be brought to every student at every class. Um, so they're also the chief evaluator of every staff member in there. And, and obviously, they're able to uh, you know, have other staff members help out or other administrators says, hey, help out. But again, you're looking at a principal that is the leadership of the entire school in so many levels of facets of that school. Um, so certainly, that person needs to be that that leader that you can go to at any particular time of the day and has that open door policy and is able to listen and then able to adapt to the uh, situations and, and how the curriculum continues to change throughout the state of Massachusetts. Megan? Sure. Thanks, Sherry. I think you already heard a great summary of the process, so I won't uh, reiterate that to you. I do think input is key, particularly when you think about the amount of lives that a principal will impact. And so I think hearing from all of those sort of impacted parties is a critical part of the process. Okay, and Greg. Um, as they all say that the role of a principal is big, as a school committee member, we don't have direct supervisory or, uh, you know, administrative role over the principal. We have, we hire the superintendent. So that's a very important part because if we're hiring the superintendent, we want the superintendent to hold the values and the belief systems or, or whatever we want them to focus on in the, uh, for that school. So then they'll use those values in, in you know, whatever they believe in that is best for the school system, 
to hire those principals. So as for input, it's good to have input from the, the community. It's like you said, it's, it's great to have that, to see what the feedback from the community is coming back is then you can look at that and say, okay, these are the questions, this is, this is how they answer them, and is this the right person for the job? Um, for interview purposes, I, I think school committee member, uh, administrators, a teacher, probably a representative of each, but when you're doing interviews, I think maybe sometimes less is more. So maybe not have like 13 people interview the, the new principal and, and overwhelm them, because then you get in all, all different situations, but maybe you have four or five that do that, and then you have the open forum, and then you can talk about it, we can talk about it as a school committee, I would think, with the, with the superintendent, that's how it goes, right? And then the superintendent will make the decision in the end. Okay, Tom, you have a... E yes, all right, so this oh, email... Just one, one moment, Mike. <laughs> this this uh, uh, citizen emailed in, and I will uh, read the email directly. It says, uh, my family moved to Milford in part because of the diversity here. It's one of our town's greatest strengths. What do you see as the role of our schools in instilling this core value of respect for diversity in our children? And why don't we begin, we'll begin with Megan. I think it's a critical role of our schools. I think equity is an incredible focus for our district. It's part of our strategic plan. It's part of our approach of our graduate. I think it's something that we're trying to drive in every facet. I think representation is key. I think that's something we always need to continue to work on, unfortunately. Uh, we're not showing much of it this evening. Uh, but I think as we go to hire new teachers and administrators, it's something that we are trying to make it a focus so that our students can see themselves in those that they're looking up to. So I think it's an important component of who we are. I think it's who Milford is. Uh, I think it's why a lot of us live here. And so it's something we definitely want to encourage in the district. Great, thanks, Megan. Uh, Greg, would you like to respond? Sure. Um, I think diversity uh, is, has, its, has, its, has its pluses and minuses, right? So diversity for diversity's sake is really not what you're looking for. In Milford, we have diversity because we have a diverse, we have a diverse uh, population in town. So back, way back when, we had the Irish population and the Italians came in and then the, the Portuguese came in. And then uh, and the Brazilians started coming in. And then we had Guatemalans and Ecuadorians, and they all contribute to the, like, the grand scheme of what, is, what, is, what, the, what the town encompasses, right? So, but what that brings problems, whether it's the English, English language learners that, that maybe uh, aren't up with the traditions that, that, that go with, uh, with the town. We can learn from them, but they also can learn from us. We want to make sure that what doesn't get lost in a shuffle with all diversity is the, you know, the traditional students that are in the town that maybe we're focusing a lot on, you know, being so diverse that we lose the lose focus on, you know, educating everybody equally. And I, I think it's okay to, to have expectations for, uh, for students too, to try to say, okay, we, we want to hire the best teachers, not necessarily the most diverse teachers. We want to, we want all the kids to, to aspire to be, to be great and not, not, not get stuff like sort of handed to them because of, because of diversity. I, I, I believe in meritocracy. So I, I well, think, the, the, how do you work the, the, no, the, the more yeah, you th th Thanks for your response. I'm just going to cut you off for a minute because the question is about instilling that core value of respect in our children, not about diversity in the school. So how do you feel about the school committee's role in instilling the value of respect for diversity in our students? I think that should be instilled by the parents at home. As a school committee member, I'm expecting, like I teach my kid to respect everybody. She, she's colorblind, respects everybody, and, and it's, it's <laughs> that should come from the home. It shouldn't come from the school committee member in my mind. You know, it's the school committee, the, the kids should learn that from their, from their parents. Fully knowing that some people don't have two parents at home, but like I said, there has to be a certain set of expectations of how kids behave and relate to other kids. Okay, uh, uh, Matt, would you like to respond? My answer is equity and inclusion. Um, kids, kids learn from each other as much as they learn from their parents and from their um, adults in the schools. And, and the more we have kids from all different backgrounds together, becoming friends and working together in small groups and learning from each other, um, they build that respect naturally. And uh, they build a lot more skills naturally as well. I'm seeing it in one of my own kids right now. She knows more Spanish as a kindergartner than I did, and I took Spanish classes. And it's, hers is all from being involved and around those students. She knows about their cultures, about their families, and what they celebrate. So that respect, I believe, is just 
naturally made, especially at a young age from these students, just by being around them. And I do, I do think it's important to call out that um, we don't get to shape our education based on the type of students that we bring in, right? Mass regulation says that you offer a fair, free, equitable education mm. to anyone who lives in this town. If they live in this town, the school committee's job is to make sure that they're all included and educated, and that's what we really have to focus on. Great, thank you. Chris? Can you just repeat the question one more time, because I think it's yeah, about the, school the, committee the, inequity? Yeah, I'll, I'll leave off the first half yeah. of it, but the, the question is, what do you see as the role of our schools in instilling this core value of respect for diversity right in our children. Yeah, and, and certainly, you know, school committee, we're charged with policy. So is there a policy that we currently have in place that we need to ensure is being followed and enacted throughout our schools? Or do we need to develop a policy? Um, you know, I would hope that we wouldn't have to develop a policy about inclusion and equity. Uh, we, we live in a world that is all about that as far as from, from America's side, right? So I look at every day when I go to work and, and the diversity with the workforce that I work with and I, and I speak with and I talk to and they give me feedback and I give them feedback, right? So they're from all over the world. Um, so I enjoy that part of it. So again, what can school committee do? We just ensure that the policies that we have in place are going to promote equity throughout our school systems. Thank you. Mike, did you have a question? May I ask one more question? I promised the last one, and then I'll Go fall right back ahead. in my hole. <laughs> That's fine. Thank you. Uh, this is to all of the candidates. Uh, during your responses, you talked about uh, things like overcrowding, spending, uh, ELL, that type of thing. Uh, if we consider the following facts, that in, in Milford, the student to teacher ratio is one of the lowest in the state. The square footage of area ratio to students is well above the state average. And Milford has one of the lowest percentages of incoming ELL students in the state. And yet, consistently for the last 10 years, we have dropped in the state rankings. Conversely, uh, municipalities like North Quincy, one of the highest percentages of incoming ELL students, are spending per student well below ours. And Lexington, which I know you might say, well, Lexington is a fairly affluent Mike, community. Mike, let's get to let's get to the question. Okay. Well, the question is, can you explain why we continue to drop in the state rankings when you consider all these steps? Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Mike. All right. Why don't we begin with uh, Let's begin with the uh, the chairman, right? Uh, Chris, we'll begin with you. <laughs> Thank you for that one. Um, I think, Mike, I would think I would challenge a lot of the information that you just brought forth. Um, you know, certainly. I think that, yeah, Milford has its challenges. Um, I see that the, our, our student population has grown. Um, if I recall, our EL population has grown. Uh, if I recall, our, our students with some type of need has greatly grown. You know, we're, we're all at in the high 60s percentage-wise for students in, of, of some type of need. So based on what that information that, that I have and that was brought to me, I would say that, yeah, we're being massively challenged within our school system and our, and our, our administration and our staff is being challenged. Um, you know, we have students that come in that simply do not know the English language very well. And we throw a state standard test in front of them and we expect them to be able to uh, do well on it and, and, and get to at least a satisfactory and meet expectations level. But I think anybody in this room that would maybe go overseas to any other country where their native language isn't English and they threw a standardized test in front of them, I don't think that anybody else is going here is going to meet expectations. So that's a challenge to us. And we're here on the school committee to meet that challenge and continue to put resources forward for students and staff to be able to meet those expectations. When I don't sit here and say, well, you know, we just lost, you know, a couple points uh, or a couple uh, spots on the standings. No, I, I, I want to support our staff and ensure that our students 
meet expectations and exceed those expectations. Thank you. Um, Matt? Um, I, would, I would have to agree with Chairman Wilson on the, um, on the challenge of some of the facts. I know that at our, our K through two schools, we're somewhere in the 18, 19 students to one teacher ratio. Um, above that, it's somewhere between 21 and 25. Uh, from, from grade three all the way up to, to uh, grade 12. I know last year we had a report from the union showing us that we had quite a few classrooms at the high school that were technically out of compliance. Now, thankfully, they didn't beat, up, beat us up on that because they understand our constraints. But um, those, are, those are not the lowest in the state by any means. Um, and it's also important to know that, that over the last five years, Milford has grown in student population the fourth most in the entire state. And we're one of 19 who has had consistent growth and not a decline in student body population. A lot of those coming in are English language learners from quite a few other places. Um, one thing I'm not proud of, you kind of mentioned it, you, you mentioned the spending, but you said it in a different way. We spend roughly $1,825 per student. That's almost $1,800 per student below the state average. So we are, we are not really where we should be if you really want to compare us to everyone in the state. But the important thing to know about why we're slipping or why it feels like we're slipping is a lot, um, a lot with what Chairman Wilson said about, about the different challenges our students face. The thing that I like to look at, especially when it comes to MCAS, is the growth percentage. We have a, a growth percentage of 55. That stat is essentially telling you how well these students are improving year over year. And what it tells us and what it tells me is that our teachers and staff are really good at meeting our kids where they are when they get here and bringing them along the way in their educational journey. And that's a really important thing to know because a lot of people like to compare us to towns around us. And when you look at that SGP percentage, we beat towns like Holliston and Franklin. We compete with Hockington. We're better than a lot of these towns right around us in taking our kids where they are and moving them along and educating them. So that doesn't mean that we're in a great spot. Everybody can do better. I don't think there's a district in town that can say, or in the state that can say that they're good enough, they don't need to change. But um, I do think we do a good job. And I think that we honestly could be investing more in our students. Great, all right, thank you. Um, Greg, would you like to respond? Sure. Um, I'm, I'm glad I have Matt here with all the, all the stats, but uh, my th I just want to give you my thoughts on the MCAS. I'm not a huge proponent of, uh, of the, the, the standardized test, just like they said. So we have extremely high learners in this, in this town, and we have a lot of people, like Chris said, that don't speak the language. And what happens is they take all those scores, and they put them in, and they come up with an average. So comparatively speaking, should we be compared to, like, Hopedale and Medway? We should probably be compared to other towns like Marlboro and things like that. But I think a better uh, indication of how the kids are doing is to really ask the teachers. The teachers feel that they're, they're learning and they're progressing, just like Matt had said. I, I think our teachers are our best resource when it comes to saying, okay, how, how, is, how are they, uh, we doing, you know, trying to integrate all these people into the classroom in, in the meantime, pushing the curriculum forward and making sure that they learn what they do. So the MCAS to me, and it, they also will, will compare like year to year, scores from like one year to the next year, and that's not really fair either, because then if you have a big influx of uh, students, it's sort of unfair to compare the year before. So to me, I, I wish they would sort of get rid of the MCAS. All right, thank you. Megan? Uh, thanks for the question, Mike. I think anyone, I hope anyone sitting at this table this year, next year, in all the years, wants scores to be better. I think that's a fundamental piece of our role. I think that's true for all components of student success, MCAS being one of those. Uh, personally, Mike, I would love for you to send us that data that is not consistent with information that I've seen on DESE. Uh, Milford is one of the highest EL growth percentages in the state. Um, and I think it, when you look at comparable districts, which are Marlboro and Barnstable and West Springfield, we are performing as good, if not better, than most of those districts. Um, and we are driving that performance. We implemented a new math curriculum last year. We need to make change. We are making changes, and we can and should do better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. We have time for one more question. Mike, Mike I'm really sorry. We're out of time. If um, you would like to communicate directly with the, the candidates. I think that would be the most appropriate Great. way to follow up on that. Thank you for understanding. Okay, we have time for one more question. We've had several be um, texted in within the last 15 minutes, so we're gonna go to it. Um, unless there's anybody else, um, we're gonna ask this last question from the texting stream. The guidance counselors at Milford High School are overburdened with the number of students they serve. They are vital in assisting students in taking the appropriate courses to follow their dreams and much more. Why have we not heard more about adding additional guidance counselors 
especially with the growth in the student population. Um, okay, so Chris, you answered first last time. Matt, would you like to answer first, please? Yeah, um, you haven't heard more about it because while it was in our budget back in January, the state cut our legs out and made us have to rethink a lot of the things we're doing. Um, I wish I could think of the term that we recently discovered, but um, guidance counselor is not one that is really used Dashley anymore. It's a term that is more centered around focusing on taking the students early and presenting them with all of the opportunities our schools have to offer because we have quite the course load that is offered to our high school students and, and we've heard from some in the past that have said that they wish they knew about some of these things that were offered earlier so they could fit them into their schedule. So uh, I think it's important that we work to um, reorganize our guidance department as a whole and add to it to bring those students from uh, their, their freshman year and even in eighth grade coming into their freshman year to set up their schedule and their path early on to drive them, whether it's towards AP classes in college or drive them towards hopefully some chapter 74 programs, which is probably still six or seven years down the road. But um, it is something that we're discussing of improving our guidance department, adding on more individuals to help and adding on more bilingual individuals to help to be able to more easily communicate. Because again, as we're talking about budget, if we have a bunch of folks who only speak English and there's a bunch of students that need assistance, we have to bring in translators to help as well. And that is an added expense. So if we can find people who can speak multiple languages, we can save some money and we can certainly help guiding these kids beyond what a guidance counselor was when I was in school, which was, you need to go to college, help, let me help you find a college and get there. That's not really the job anymore. The job is to guide them from the beginning all the way through in the best path that we can give them. So it's something we're working on and hopefully we can find some funding in the near future to, to continue to grow it. Okay, Chris? Thank you. Um, you know, certainly, yeah, the guidance department and the need throughout the guidance department is, is ever expanding. You know, our, our student population has expanded. Uh, as a as a parent of a senior, I know that that guidance counselor was tasked with writing a letter of recommendation. So can you imagine how many letters of recommendation a single guidance counselor would have to write for the vast number of seniors that they, they have in, in a graduating class? They also have to look at the juniors, the sophomores, and the freshmen and help them, guide them, as Matt had said, for their schedules over the next few years and, and set a pathway for what their goals are when they graduate. So certainly earlier I said one of the best things that I could, one of the best traits from sitting here or being on the school committee is listening. So certainly I would want to listen to the guidance department. I would want that guidance department to come up with rationale of why they need expansion of their staff, promote it to their principal, have the principal promote it to the superintendent and have the superintendent promote it to the school committee because ultimately if we don't see that initiative come to us on during budget season, then we don't know it's, that it's a need. So again, it's, it's that level of communication that needs to happen. If it doesn't happen through a budget cycle, then I would say that the guidance department can certainly reach out to school committee as a whole and, and express their concerns so that we can address it. Thank you. Megan. It is absolutely a critical need. It was absolutely identified as a priority. It was something we pushed forward this year and then had to pull back on when the Chapter 70 aid didn't come through. It is a complicated process, never mind financial aid, so it's definitely something we'd like to support more. Uh, we are starting to do more, even at the younger grade, which I really like. I know Mr. Otlin went in and spoke to the eighth graders about programming in the high school. We're trying to develop more pathways. There are some things in action, but I look forward to the opportunity to fund this as soon as we can. And Greg. I think that uh, going off of what I, I really like what Matt, Matt had said about guiding the kids, not just from uh, like when we were back at school, the, the guidance counselor you would go to them and, and like you said, they would, they would sort of direct you, oh, you, you, what do you want to do when you graduate? What schools do you want to go to? The, the, to? To sort of give them ideas and guide them through. And I also like what Chris had said because the, the budget comes into play. So taking this year out, so say we had the money to do it. We'd, I would want to look at why they think they need more guidance counselors, what their purpose is going to be, what, what their plans were to help, you know, bring, get those things across to the students, and also how many students are accessing them. I know, talking to a lot of parents, some, some kids access the guidance counselors, some don't at all and go to Duke, you know. So it's one of those things, it's like, if we hire a guidance counselor, will it take away from somewhere else in the budget that we could potentially 
improve the education. Maybe take away from a vocational spot. Maybe you could take away from, from another class or, or instituting uh, more music or more art or something like that. So I would want to look at it and put it through that lens I was talking about. How does it improve the quality of education? Okay. Okay. All right. We have reached the end of the forum. I would like to thank all of the candidates for participating tonight and sharing your vision and your goals for the Milford community and for all of our students in the Milford Public School System. Could we please have a round of applause for all of our candidates who participated tonight? Before we close, we just have a few brief announcements. We would like to invite everyone to participate in this year's Milford Beautification Day. That will be held on Saturday, April 27th. You are welcome to come anytime between 9 a.m. and 1 p.m. to the municipal parking lot on Main Street, located across from Sacred Heart Church. And from there, we'll give you gloves, trash bags, and assignments. We're pleased to report that the Lions Club will once again be grilling hamburgers and hot dogs for all of the volunteers. Also, we will soon be accepting new sponsorships and renewals for the Draper Memorial Park Field of Flags. Our first display will be for Memorial Day. Information about the flags as well as some other community projects, including voting information, is located on the welcome table with the uh, red, white, and blue bunting over here at the front of the room. And most importantly, Milford voters, citizens for Milford, hopes that tonight's forum was informative. We urge you all to vote, whether by absentee ballot or in person. Per the town clerk's office, the deadline to register to vote is 5 p.m. on Saturday, March 23rd. Election day is Tuesday, April 2nd, and polls will be open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Thank you, everyone, and good night.